Welcome to Season 3 of The Lifestyle Chase, and I'm your host, Chris Little. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. To help this podcast grow, please share it on social media, rate five stars, tell your friends, and check out the past 140 episodes and counting. You can follow me on Instagram at Christian Little and at The Lifestyle Chase. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. All right, so welcome to The Lifestyle Chase. This is episode 145, and I'm joined by the one and only Matt Dominey. How are you doing today? Hey, guys, I'm doing really well. Uh, Chris, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You bet. Um, I want to paint a picture of your daily routine. So like, how does your day start? What's the first thing that you do? So I still am an independent trainer and I still work, uh, I still train clients uh, in person as well. So usually what happens is I'll, I'll usually wake up around like, depending on what time, what day, what day of the week it is. Uh, I'll usually wake up around like 4.30 in the morning or five in the morning and train my first client, uh, depending on who, what time he's coming in. At either 5 30 or 6. Um, so that that's Monday through Friday every day. Um, so that's the first thing is usually that I drink my breakfast in a protein shake in the morning and I've drank the same protein shake and coffee for the last probably, man, I don't know, probably since 2013 when I started picking up 5 a.m. clients. So it's 2020. So it's probably seven years now. I've had the exact same breakfast every single day. Um, sounds about right. All the other trainers who are going to listen to this are going to go, yep, that's me. I do the same thing. Um, cause that's, that's just how our life is, man. It's like, I'm not waking up at four 30 in the morning and like making a full breakfast for myself. Like, absolutely not. I'm not making one the night before cause I'm tired and go to bed. Um, so usually in the morning I'll have like three or four clients. So I'll usually train from either five or six to like 11 o'clock. And then I, uh, I, I start working on the stuff that I do with, uh, with Kyle for compound performance. So there it's going to be like remote training, client updates, client response videos, uh, the group mentorship calls, any calls that I've got with Kyle himself. Um, and then usually a couple uh, clients in the evening as well from like four to like six or seven. Awesome. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction, just like it's nicer to have somebody else introduce a person than having to introduce yourself. So for my audience, um, I came across Matt partly because of social media, partly because of the compound performance mentorship that I just finished, but I've seen you on social media for like upwards of a year. And I never knew as much about you as I knew after going through the mentorship. And some of the things that stand out to me is like, you're a very like strong individual, like there's no question, but also just like, if ever a person is looking for somebody that like genuinely cares, Matt Domney is a person that genuinely cares. Now he masks it with trolling yeah, through the DMs. Thank you. Of <laughs> and course. Like, That's what you gotta do. I, I find some of the kindest, most thoughtful people are pretty sneaky with it. Like we'll just we'll be very genuine, but um we'll try and like guard our genuineness by like trolling people and like friendly teasing and stuff. But I would have to say, like the amount that I learned from like your knowledge with programming and even just the takeaways that I got with my own training with AMRAP, like for anybody that's never tried AMRAP, you got to find a way to get onto that program because like the amount of gains you'll get from that is just unreal. Like everything that I did got better I with that. AMRAP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, that's, I mean, that was a, that was a fun program to, to put together. Um, and like, a lot of people have had a lot of really, really good success on it. So I appreciate the, uh, the kind words on that one. Thank you. Well, when it comes down to program design, like when was the first moment that you decided, like you had a distinct interest in, in designing programs or just like getting analytical with that whole process of like making people stronger and making them more capable? So for me, for program design, um, I've been com- like training as a power lifter, training in strength sports and trying to get continuously stronger since probably about 2010. Um, so I've been, I've been trying to continuously get better and build my own self up to do more and just be like be more capable and a stronger person for probably about 10 years now. And 
when I started becoming a coach, that was the one thing that I wanted to do was I, I've always wanted to work on like helping to make other people stronger. Um, and that's, that's where it really comes down to is like a lot of like a lot of trial and error and a lot of experimentation and reading and trying to find out different resources that I can also use uh, to experiment on myself and try on other people to make them as strong as I possibly can too. Um, so that's, that's one of the, one of the biggest things that I've, I've, I've found for myself is just a lot of trial and error to get myself to where I am now. I've done a lot of dumb stuff and I've messed up on myself quite a bit. And, uh, now I try to not apply those less, I try to like, remember what I did and not do that with other people. So having started all that stuff in 2010, at what point did you start to really dial it in with like your work with spreadsheets? Like what sets you apart in my eyes is you have a really strong understanding of how you can best utilize like simple processes. Like the amount of things that you taught us how to do with like Excel, I was like, holy shit, you can do that. Like, how did you get into that world? So with that, well, it basically, so what I, what I look at with this is like, I am an inherently lazy person. Um, unless I'm scheduled out to do something, I'm not going to do anything. So with me, what I'm looking at with this is what I try to do with like something like a spreadsheet or an Excel sheet is I try to find out and work with the end in mind of what information am I trying to collect that'll make my life easier to program out with a, with a, with a client. Right. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for, um, I have a bunch of data in the back end of mine where it's like compliance to uh, total like sets that I'm looking to do total prescribed volume versus total actual volume, all of the things that I'm looking to do, like I'm, I'm trying to figure out different ways that I can use to um, build out compliance and see how a lifter is progressing over time because it makes my life a lot easier because I can just look at something and go, okay, this goes up, this goes up, this goes down, this goes down. Or like, like this gets heavier, this gets heavier, this gets lighter, this gets heavier, this one goes up, this one goes down, this day moves the way that I want it to go. And it made my life a lot easier to just try to learn as much as I could about things like Excel, because the more that I can do with it, the easier it makes my life in terms of data collection, which gives me the ability to program out better and more effectively for the people that I'm working with. So I can like plan periodization schemes a little bit better. I can plan individual weeks and sessions a little bit better, and I can kind of catch things as they need to. So if I'm looking at a session uh, at, a, at a lifter who's doing really, really well over the course of a training cycle, but their deadlift is suffering and everything else is moving up, we might just take a little break and deload that deadlift as opposed to deloading everything else and drive the other things a little bit more. Because like the way, the way that I'm looking at this is the way that I look at programming now is like every like systemic fatigue is definitely going to be one of the most important factors to consider when we're looking at uh, building a training program and, and training people over time. But there's a lot of things that we can say for like if we're looking at performance as a whole, we can probably eke out a lot of extra gains if we don't just deload everything all at the same time. And if we're to structure it a little bit more effectively with uh, looking at what stimulus a person is not recovering from anymore, right? So if we're looking at like, if they're, if they're not recovering from, like if they're doing really well on their squat, like I'm probably not gonna deload that one at all. I'll probably just keep driving that one until we need to. But we can always throttle back the bench or the deadlift while those are uh, the ones that we have to recover a little bit better. So that's one of the things that I look at with the spreadsheets is it gives me a lot more data that I can use to look at this as a whole and not just make a blanket statement of like three weeks on one week off, three weeks on one week off. I like that. And I can appreciate like the, the technical know-how, like what was the, the first um, direction that you took when you were wanting to learn more about spreadsheets? Like, did you learn from somebody else? Did you just Google it? Did you take like an Excel course? Honestly, it was just trial and error and Googling it and uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do on my own. And like, that's the thing is like, there's a ton of free resources on uh, the internet about how to make Excel do what you want it to do. Um, and then all it really comes down to is just reading and comprehending the formulas that you're looking to, to figure out, right? Where it's like, if you're like, I always, I basically like try to get everybody to start with like basic addition, subtraction or multiplication. And then from there, we just go to uh, much more in depth uh, formulas after that, because what you, you guys can, you can make some very, very incredibly in-depth one that kind of like tag things for whatever it is you want. Uh, you just have to like start with the basics and learn how to get everything else done after that. It's kind of like learning how to read, right? Like we all start off reading a book. We all start reading off like, like C spot run, which is like all of the, the biggest word is like a four letter word. And now we're all reading at like the, like a third grade level, which is probably where I stopped, but we're all reading at a significantly higher level than we were before. And we have a lot of better ability to comprehend um, like syntax and grammar and much more complex words and, and, uh, and thoughts 
Um, so it ends up kind of being the same thing with this is like you're just learning a new you're basically teaching yourself a new language with a with spreadsheets and that's what you kind of have to do is like understand that that's how it's going to be and you can't just try to jump into the really complex stuff right away and you have to figure out how to get yourself into that position totally um we're gonna pivot a little bit so with you working with kyle dobbs like where when did you meet him uh what was your first impression and what um cements your uh your partnership as people that work together in this mentorship and just in the business? So in 2019, I was at a corporate gym that I absolutely hated and I was really, really stale in my development because the gym that I was at would consistently bring the same four pieces of continuing education down. And it was a gym chain that I'd been working with since 2013. And I had done every single one of those continuing education things or uh, seminars that they were bringing in back in 2013. So this is eight, six years later and they're still bringing in the exact same ones. And I'm like, cool, like I, I'm not gonna take a level one kettlebell cert for the fifth time because like, I'm not gonna get anything out of this one. Like I like the instructor and he's a really cool guy, but like, I, I got it. Like I've been doing, <laughs> I've been doing like kettlebell swings and like windmills for like five years now. Like I know how to, I'm pretty sure I know how to, I'm at least proficient with this. Um, so my, my development was very, very, very stale. And it's like, like another one was like pre and postnatal. So it's like, yeah, I mean, once you kind of get that done once, you don't really like, you can get a refresher course, but like the rules don't change from time to time. Cause like the fetus doesn't change from like 2013 to 2020. Like that's just the same as how it's always been. So like, I was very, very stale in my own development. So I hired, I, I was looking for a mentor and, um, I originally reached out to a couple other people and they were significantly out of my price range. Uh, and I then finally found and stumbled, I was recommended to, to go check out Kyle Dobbs. Um, uh, and I finally hired him to, to mentor me in, in January of 2019. Uh, I told him that at the point, at the point that I was looking, I was competing in a powerlifting meet at the end of January. And I was like, listen, I, I definitely want to do this. Uh, but I don't want to get started until after I've done my meet because I want to focus on this and I don't want to try to overload myself with too many other things. Because like I said, for me, if I don't schedule everything out, like as an inherently lazy person, I'm not going to do it. And that also is another thing that I, I try to do well is like schedule myself out accordingly, because if I over schedule, I also do nothing. Um, so Kyle gave me the kind of standard answer that he get, that he gives to everybody who uh, doesn't that he doesn't think is going to do anything, which is basically like cool. See on social media or like see on the internet, um, because I was like I, I'm looking to. I, I reached out to him at the very beginning of January, and I was like I will love to start in February, and he's like that's not going to happen. I don't believe him. And then around like right after my meet, like literally the next day, I shot him a text and I was like hey, ready to go. Send me the invoice. Let's get it started. I'm ready to start whenever you want to start with me. And he's like oh okay cool. So he was serious about this. So I I. I so I, I got him to mentor me for three months. Uh, it was a great experience. So that was kind of how I got started with Kyle, how I met Kyle in general in the beginning. Um, and then after that, he started, like, he, I don't know, I don't even know what it was that he asked me, to, why he asked me to, to come on. Like, I tried to pitch him training to, because I didn't want to pay him, pay, pay him for the mentorship anymore, but I still wanted to work with him. So I was like, yo, why don't you just let me train you for free? And he was like, all right, we can make it, we can make that work. So he, I trained him for free for a little bit. He mentored me for free for a little bit. And then he decided to uh, bring me into the group mentorship to help other people because he had, um, he wanted to, to launch the group mentorship product. And he had a couple of his other mentees come in and try to help other people. And apparently I did a good enough job that he wanted to bring me on to work with him. So now I work with him and I, I run uh, probably about half of the group mentorship. Um, we share pretty much all the calls and, uh, yeah, that's where I am now. I take all the remote training clients. I do that. Well, I don't take any of the remote training clients anymore. All the new ones go to our new guy, Sam. Uh, but I do half the group mentorship and we're launching another couple of education products pretty soon that I'm excited about as well. Well, I mean, that's a pretty big moment in anybody's career. Um, did you find that you learned some stuff about yourself in that whole like transition and like starting on the whole compound performance journey? So I come from a long line of people that have always owned their own businesses. And when I was working for other people, it was me trying to, it's like the, one of the greatest lines that I ever heard is like, if you're trying to own, if you want to own your own business, work for somebody else for as long as you possibly can, 
Um, because what you want to do is you want to fail and make as many mistakes on somebody else's dime as you possibly can. And that was something that stuck with me. So I tried to, I tried to make it as long as I could possibly go and make as many mistakes as I could possibly make at somebody else's expense. Because like, that's one of the biggest things that happens is when you're, when you own your own business, it's all on you. And for me, that gives me a lot more peace and solace because at the end of the day, like if I'm not doing something to move the needle in the right direction, that's fully on me. And I understand that. And like, I'm totally fine with taking ownership of that. And the fact that it was, it was me that is causing this issue. And like, that was the, so that's, but so that was one of the biggest things that was, was the driver for me to even go on my own and my, uh, go on my own was like, I was tired of having other people's life affect mine. Right. And I was tired of having other people's decisions that they would make impact me negatively when I was doing everything that I could. And I was like, okay, well at this point, I'm ready to just kind of go out on my own and do this and just be the one that is responsible for all the decisions. And like looking back on it, I would never, I would never change it, but I would also highly recommend that other people follow a similar path because you can make a lot of mistakes on somebody else's dime. And then you don't lose your house because of them. Like you don't stop having money to pay rent. You don't stop having to worry about anything else. Like your paycheck is still going to come in. Whereas like if I'm training my people in my garage and I make a mistake and I lose all of my clients is like, well, shit, I'm out of money. I got nothing else going on. I got to find something else to do quick. So that's one of one of the biggest things that I found is that like, you need to have the ability to make mistakes on somebody else's time first before you can do that on your own because it's real. It's like when you own your own business and when you're doing things for yourself, like it's real out there, and it's you need to have that level of comfortability and confidence in yourself beforehand where you're willing to fail and you're willing to make mistakes, but you're also like like set up enough financially to be able to make the mistakes and not have to worry about like finding a place to live if you get evicted. Well, that's so true. And I mean, like for anybody listening to this, they can get more context on you by looking at your other podcast appearances. And I'm going to try and not get you to repeat the same things that you've talked about on other shows. But um, I do want to talk a little bit about your martial arts experience in context to like, What is it about martial arts that you may or may not have utilized in your present day life today? Were there like skills or lessons that you reflect on like now in 2020? Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I think every child should do some sort of martial arts. Uh, Just the level of competence that it gives you, the level of of self-assuredness that it gives you and just like the, the lessons that it teaches you, the discipline, the perseverance and all the things that it actually teaches you are significantly more valuable than whatever else you're going to get out of it. Like a lot of these people um, will look at like a lot of martial arts and be like, well, that's kind of like hokey. Like it's kind of like, like doesn't really have anything to do with self-defense, but it's not that it's that that I'm looking at as, as a lot of the lessons is like, yeah, I mean, that stuff is great, but at the same time you get the ability to, to, to show that you can persevere in a system for a long period of time. Right. You have to master repetitive tasks because all of the tasks are the exact same. So you have to kind of be able to get yourself into that state of mind where you can just put your nose to the grindstone and do something repeatedly. Um, and like, those are the biggest lessons that you kind of get out of it. And that's the, the stuff that like has carried with me for the, for forever. It's like, that's why like, I tra- when I transitioned into powerlifting, like I squat bench and deadlift every like three times a week each. And like, that's it. And it's, I've been doing that for like eight years now or like close to 10 years now. And like, I just, it's not boring to me at all because like, I used to train and like, so like one of the things that I, I, don't, I don't know if I've talked about it with a lot of other people is like, I, I'm, I'm classically trained in Japanese sword as well. And I did that from the time I was 14 until I was 20. And I remember one time going out to a, a, um, a, a, my instructor's house in Arizona in July in Phoenix, Arizona, when it's 110 degrees or 120 degrees in the middle of the day and standing outside and having him go, okay, you did this one cut really well. Now you're going to practice that. And I'm like, okay, cool. For how long? He goes until I come back. And like he, like it was like ten in the morning, and he no joke came back at like two thirty p.m. I was like, are you still going? And I was like, yes, I haven't, I, like I haven't stopped because you told me to. And like that's one of the things that I think like a lot of people need to learn about just being better at being a human is like you need to be able to persevere through boring stuff because that's the stuff that's going to make you better at whatever it is that you're looking to do. Well, I mean, persevering through boring stuff, but then also, like, as far as, like, following a program goes, like, I definitely, like, there's parts of the AMRAP program that I know some people skip over, and I was, like, finding ways to progress them. Like, 
what I liked about that program was if if you had the right like approach to a challenge and you were willing to take on all the aspects on it not just cherry pick your favorite but actually do like the sled push like that was a lot of sled push (laughs) like i was dead after all of that it was like 300 yards i'm calculating it in my gym and it's like six or seven back and forth or something like that i was like holy shit man but i did it and then i had i had results So I hope that people, when they take your mentorship, I hope that they understand that they're going to have to apply themselves. They're going to have to learn how to groove in like what they have to do. Like nobody's just going to hold your hand and like do it for you. Nobody's going to hand you the gains or, or give you progress in your business. Like if you apply yourself and put yourself into the variables, like then you'll get outcomes. Oh, for sure. And like, that's one of the, one of the things that I keep looking at with this is like, People come to us when they're looking for the mentorship or for us to help develop their business and help to give them give them all of the keys. But all we're doing is we're just kind of trying to show you the way, and then you have to take all the steps yourself. Like that's one of the thing, the, one of the biggest things that we got with the with the uh, the case studies that we sent out for the last round is like we just we didn't have as many people as we thought we were going to have send them back. And it's like okay, well, like I'm not going to fill these out for you. You have to do this yourself. This is your business. This is your education. This is what you're trying to do. It has nothing to do with what I'm trying to do. Like I like I don't know if they know if you realize this, but like you you're in my business. <laughs> like you're paying you're paying me for a service. So you have to now be the one that takes the impetus to do all of this stuff on your own and complete these tasks. And if you don't, like I care, but like only to a certain extent because that like the, if if your business doesn't succeed the way that you want it to, it's not it's nobody else's fault but yours. And like that's what I think a lot of what a lot of people need to, to understand is like you need to be able to have the 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 wherewithal to do what you need to do and understand what you're bad at and then do that stuff to get better at it and then also figure out a way to maximize the strengths that you have as a person so you can do what you need to do and just show everybody how much better you are, but also get better at the weaknesses that you have so you can be more well rounded and more complete as a person. Absolutely. And I'll be like the first to admit while I didn't send my case study in, um, I have it, I have dual screen monitors at my desk and I have my case study open, like when I'm like figuring out my tasks for the day. And I just reference that because there's so much that I can reference for like, uh, just what I'm fitting into my calendar. Like if I have some, some dead space in my day, well, can I work on some of the things like my google sheets can i refine some of my processes can i work on spreadsheets because maybe like there's something i want to learn about spreadsheets that i didn't quite grasp and so anybody that's kind of like feeling oh i i dropped the ball like have the case study open it's not dead it's not like extinct like it's still extremely valuable and then anybody that's like on the fence as to whether they join or not like it's it's like this resource that's going to be valuable for quite a few years to come it's kind of like a lot of the other applications that we talked about like the continuing education where it's like do you recertify with that same kettlebell course like seven times in a row well i mean like with the case study like you're still going to be able to apply those same concepts and do that same like um assessment of like money in money out time management resource management and diversification of your income streams like that's it was so cool to see um, the the broad array of fitness professionals in the group, to see people that are yeah. new, to see people that have been at it for like 15 years. Like it was open to anybody, which was awesome because then we could yeah. all lean on each other's skills. And that's one of the things that we, we try to do with this is we, we understand that like what we provide is a better structure and organization to this than a lot of other people do but we all, everybody's input is valuable, right? So that's like the people ask us questions about stuff, but other people will chime in and answer questions all the time. Like that's one of the things that will happen in the Slack forum, uh, the Slack channel that we have, is a bunch of other people will answer a lot of the questions that we that, that get asked in there before Kyle and I will see them, and they've got really solid answers. So it's like that's it's a, it's a useful thing because there's a lot of other people and there's a lot of other uh, uh, perspectives on things that is a very, very useful um, thing for everybody to get because they're not just getting the same voice rep- repeatedly like over and over and over again. They're starting to learn from other people. They're starting to figure out other things as well, which is cool. 
Definitely. So there's something that really stands out to me when it comes to a career in this industry, and it's just um, we're all crazy people. Like I've heard this on so many podcasts as of late, like how like as trainers or coaches, we just obsess on our career. We're like hyper focused on our goals, be that in the gym or like with with our clients. We almost we care more about our clients' progress than our own. Um, I want you to expand on your own experience like that. With that, because I know, like, I'll give you an example for myself. If somebody asks, like, Chris, what do you do outside of fitness? I don't have much of an answer because I'm just like all fitness all the time, like spare time fitness, work fitness, fun fitness, and so I have to like push myself to do other things. Um, what's What's your experience with that, like? So, I mean, that's one of, the, one of those things that, like, I'm intensely aware that I'm a 30-year-old man that posts videos of himself squatting on the internet and posts memes about fitness. And, like, I live on a small speck of dust in this very large, like, infinitely large, incomprehensibly large universe, hurtling through space at thousands of miles, tens of thousands of miles an hour, arguing about respiration strategies with other specks of dust that don't even matter long term. So, like, that's one of those things that I'm looking at, too, is, like, what I want to what I want to be as a person is I want to figure out a way that I can be as well rounded as I possibly can and not be that guy that only has fitness in his life to talk about because that's one of those the the if that's if there's nothing wrong with it if that's what's if that's what you do but at the same time like I just find that to be an incredibly boring uh, way to live my life so I try to go on hikes I try to go outside I try to do things with my other friends that are that are non fitness related. Um, and that's one of the things that I do with my with my Instagram is like my Instagram is only like fitness and, and dogs. I post no personal things. I post nothing else about like anything else. So like nobody knows anything else about my life outside of that. But that's because I have a life outside of that that I don't want to have bleed over into social media. Because like as as people get more like a larger following and a larger base, it's, like, it's one of those things that becomes very very hard to separate between like your social media and like who you are it kind of becomes your identity like you start playing a character of who you are on social media and who other people think you are which is like it's it's a very i, I find that to be like a very kind of scary thing because you end up kind of losing yourself and who you are and if you lose social media and that's gone then who are you anymore like you're no longer a guy that squats and posts videos on the internet of him squatting anymore so it's like okay well we've got to figure out a different thing that we can do to become a better human and a more well-rounded human just in case anything like this happens and you lose that outlet, what else are you going to do instead? Where it's like, I play guitar, I read books, I try to go outside, I try to like hang out with friends and do stuff that is not fitness related. Like when I'm talking to like my friends about just like general stuff, the last thing that I want to talk about is training or anything else like that at all. And like I talked about that, I actually had a conversation with my coach about that over the weekend where we talked about a little bit of training stuff. And at the end, we both kind of just like, like DM each other back and forth, like, oh, that was exhausting. Because like you can bring fitness stuff out of me every once in a while, but like I would much rather talk about literally anything else other than that because it's just not it's just not, not one of the it's like we we live in an extremely small micro microcosm of, of fit people who care about fitness and who care about the the gym in general. And our job as fitness professionals is not to talk to other fitness professionals. Our job as fitness professionals is to talk to the general public who is not in shape and who is not who are not active and we're not going to do that if all we have in our life and all we can talk about is fitness we have to have something else that we can do that we can relate to these people with that'll allow them to see commonalities and then pay us money to train them to make them better well i think that's important and i mean like for anybody listening just like the whole concept of like if you're a person that's approaching a mentorship, there's got to be a reason why you're approaching the mentorship. Perhaps like you're not where you want to be with the use of your time. Maybe you're just so busy and you just need more spare time or you need more client sessions or you need more income, etc. But no matter what stage you're at, you need to sort of address those holes. Like you need to plan that time. Like even if you're looking to catch up to something, it's still important to mandate time for going on hikes or petting dogs or talking about Pokemon or like whatever it is. And I think this is something that I have to remind myself of often because I find myself always like just work, 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 work. We'll have time later. But like uh, we only have so much time. We're not always going to have time later to like make time for the life aspects. So hopefully if anybody like... 
finds themselves thinking about that they're like oh oh crap i should probably plan a little hike this weekend or spend time with family and friends or go to a restaurant or something like that absolutely and that's one of the things that happens particularly in fitness where to make money you trade hours for dollars so if you're not working you're not making any money and that's one of the one of the things that happens with the commission-based job it's a little bit more difficult is it's a lot harder for people to break out of it because you're all you have is if you're not working you're not being paid and it's like okay well that's all i'm going to focus on because i like making money and i need to make money and i need to like be able to pay my bills and pay my rent and pay my like mortgage or whatever it is that i'm paying or like if you're dean guido pay your boat pay off your boat um i have to mention him because it's like it's it's fun for me to bother him about his boat for sure um but like that's what you have to do. Like you have to figure out different things that you can do to, to talk, to, to make more income. And a lot of people, what they don't realize is they think that what they can do to, to increase their income and increase their, 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 uh, their hours per week of work is to take another certification or take another course or take another mentorship or take another thing. And like as somebody who runs a mentorship and runs a course, what I can tell you is that like, that's not the way to make a, to get better at what you're doing. The way to get better at what you're doing is to become a better human that people want to hang out with a little bit more, right? Like, I don't care what three-letter acronym you have. I have literally never once been asked by a client, like, what acronyms that I have, especially if you're looking at the general population. Like, the general public does not know what any of that stuff means. you are like, oh, I just got my PRID and SFRC certification this week. And they're like, <laughs> all right, cool, thumbs up. I don't know what that means for me. What, what is like, what is that? It's like, they don't, they don't know. They don't care. And it doesn't really matter to them. And like, I feel like that's one of those things that happens a lot here is like, and that's what we do with our mentorship is like most of our mentorship is based off of like, there's, there's training stuff involved in like how to do better with your individual sessions and how to build better programs. But most of what it is, is about like the first month is about how to become a better human. And like, what are your strengths and weaknesses? What are your likes and dislikes? What do you, what are your values and what do you look for? that helps you become a better person that helps you market yourself a little bit more because that's what people are attracted to. People aren't attracted to you based off of what you know. They're, they're attracted to you based off of what, how you make them feel. Well, I mean, it's so true. And I mean, going into the mentorship, I knew my strengths throughout my whole career. My, my personality, just my silliness has kind of given me an edge. So coming out of the gates, I was tossing up those crazy uh, zoom backgrounds. Cause I was like, heck, I know how to do an icebreaker. I'll just ride that wave. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's like you're trying to figure out different things that you can do to distinguish yourself uh, right away. Like that's that's the that's what we need to figure out how to do as people is, especially if you work on a gym floor when you've got like 25 other trainers that work with you that are all wearing the same uniform, all wearing the same shirt. You're all but just a bunch of fit guys and girls. Like you've got to figure out what separates you from these from your coworkers that you can go talk to these people, uh, your clients about, your prospective clients about. And 99% of the time, unless it's an extremely specific client or somebody who's coming in with very, very specific goals for a very specific reason, they don't care about your education or your knowledge. It's true. They care about how you make them feel. Like, as long as you don't hurt them, they're probably going to be okay with what you're, what you're doing. So for you being someone that's part of like a, a mentorship, like just providing guidance to others, providing people like the structure framework to get to their next goal. Do you set goals for yourself personally? Like, do you have like a two year plan, five year plan? What does that look like for you? I don't have a two year or five year plan. What I find is that I, what I try to do is I try to make it a little bit more tangible. Uh, so I try to chunk it down a little bit lower and make month goals. Um, so I, I try to look at it as, as a course of like, a, like an individual month or quarter or quarterly goals. Because what I find is if like all the quarterly or monthly goals are moving in the right direction, then the yearly goal is also moving in the right direction. Then the, bi like the two year goal is moving in the right direction. And then the five year goal is also moving in the right direction. And that's kind of the way that I've always been about it is like, it's, it's, I want to have that, that short term goal site first, because what I find of a lot of people who make very big, like long plans, unless they're like super structured and outlined and broken down into each year, each month, each quarter, you're just setting yourself up as an excuse, as a, like an excuse to fail because there's no urgency. Right. So with that five-year plan, if it has no specific steps involved, 
well, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter what I do today because in five years from now, this is where I'm going to be. I was like, okay, but you don't realize that what you're doing today matters and makes a difference for what you're going to be doing in four or five years. And like, that's where, where I feel like the, like breaking it down and chunking it up a little bit easier into months and quarters makes it a lot more tangible and it lights a fire under people's ass a lot more because, oh, well, my goal for the end of the week was to do this and I didn't do that today. So now I'm one seventh of like, I've wasted one seventh of my time. As opposed to if I'm looking at that over five years, what's that like 1800 days where it's like, okay, well, I wasted one out of 1800 days. That's a, it's like under 1%. It doesn't even matter to me, but one out of seven is a much larger percentage of time to waste. And like, that's a, that's a much bigger deal for people. Well, I, that's like a powerful way to look at it. Like I've had discussions with people on goals and I think the most like achievable way to look at it is, as you said, like taking that bigger number and then structuring it down to like, what does that look like applied to like a one week span then week two week three week four etc but in terms of like one month or one quarter um what is it that you use what's what's your key indicators for deciding what your goals are going to be or the direction that you're going to go or like what what delegates that that thought process for you so what I'm looking at doing over that is I'm just looking at kind of reviewing the previous month and like assessing the wins and losses of the prior month. Um, and this is something that, like this is something that Kyle and I do very, very often is we like we have a lot of Zoom calls like internally where we look at what we've done well, what we have done poorly, and we're very objective with ourselves about, okay, well, this was a good win and this is a huge loss. So how can we minimize that uh, that loss for next month? to make sure that this doesn't happen again so that we can continuously move the needle in the right direction. So it's just a lot, being a lot more objective and honest with yourself and looking at it from a, from like a, like a bird's eye view of like 30,000 feet and showing and just be, being really transparent about where you messed up and where you failed. Yeah. Um, we mentioned Dean Guido and his boat recently, and I kind of want to steer it in more of a lifestyle direction so like a guy like dean got a boat and a boat's not necessarily going to help him with his career aside from the fact he gets a lot of shout outs on instagram for it but what about you for like lifestyle like what what do you gear yourself towards to uh like as far as goals for your lifestyle are you looking at like going on a holiday or getting a new cool thing or something like that so for me right now, I'm, I, I just talked a whole lot about like having a work-life balance. And now I'm going to talk about why I don't have a work-life balance. Um, I am at the point right now where we're trying to launch and try to build a, a new business. So we're in technically the start, we're in kind of the startup phase where it's like time off is not really something that happens. And like I scheduled and I took some time off uh, like last week for my birthday. But like other than that, like I pretty much do at least a minimum of like two to three hours of work every single day and like by two to three hours of work i mean like i'll wake up do two hours and i'll come back and i'll come back and do another two hours it's like i work often throughout the course of the day and i don't ever get a i I don't ever get a full day off but like we're also trying to build a business and trying to survive through like the time when everything gets shut down and trying to survive through the age of social media where saturation is at such an all-time high in terms of what other people are doing where we have to figure out our ways that we're going to differentiate ourselves so that's it's kind of what we're looking to do, and is just trying to figure out how we can how we can differentiate ourselves um, and continuously work and try to push the needle in the way that we want to push it. Because, like I talked about earlier, like I'm a I'm a 30 year old man that posts squat videos on the internet. Like I'm painfully aware of that fact, and I'm painfully aware that, that fitness is a very transient field, and that longevity and fitness is a pain in the ass. And like when I'm 40 and I've got kids, I don't want to be waking up at four in the morning like I'm doing right now to train people because that sucks and like training people at 7 p.m. because that sucks and it's like I don't have I wouldn't have any time to spend with like with family so we're trying to figure out different things that we can do that'll that'll be like short-term difficult and short-term hard to make long-term success a lot easier and a lot more uh, feasible that we can then use to reduce the amount of work that we're doing so it's a lot of work up front to hopefully have a like a large reduction in the future yeah and i mean that makes sense and i think a lot of people find themselves in those zones quite often it's just like um if you have like a reason for putting in that level of effort then that level of effort has a bit more validation to it but if you don't have a reason 
then you're kind of spinning your wheels. Like you might feel like you're making progress by working really hard, but if you don't have like that plan or at least you can't you don't have a formula to come up with that outcome like if a person knows that they're putting in hours towards creating content or they're putting hours towards a curriculum or they're putting hours towards like material then they know that the outcome will be that they have something that they can use for reoccurring income in a different form but if they're just like uh putting in time going through social media hoping that people look at their posts and stuff like that well then that can be very draining very quickly yeah and there's a there's a big difference between being busy and being productive like it's super easy to sit there and be busy and say that you're busy and it's really really different when you're actually doing things that are productive and trying to tangibly move the needle the way that you want to move it absolutely and I guess like the, the example that you brought up about social media is like there are so many people that just mindlessly scroll social media. And if you look at like I think one of the best things that Instagram has done recently is give you that like in, in that and your insights and like your how much time you're spending on the app. Where it's like I spend probably about I spend my the last uh, the average that I spent on it last week was about two hours and forty five minutes. Or it's like I try not to mindlessly scroll. I'm answering messages. I'm answering DMs from clients. I'm answering a lot of different things. But I'm on social media for about two hours and 45 minutes or three, closer to three hours a day. And that is time that I'm not doing other things. Like that's a three hour period of time where I'm not being as productive, where I'm trying to figure out how to multitask and I'm not good at multitasking, where I, I'm not driving the, the needle the way that I want to drive it because I have to do this, this other thing at that period of time. So like that's the thing is like trying to figure out how to be productive and schedule yourself into productive blocks is something that we go over in the mentorship. But like I think that's an important thing for a lot of people to learn because especially when you're making your own, when you're doing your own business, it's super easy to be busy and then have nothing accomplished by the end of the day. Something that uh, Dean and Jeb Stewart Johnston talked about in their podcast from like it's like a year old podcast, but it stands out to me. But they talked about like a teddy bear, like protecting your teddy bear like say something was near and dear to you and i was like you got to stop doing that man and it was like your teddy bear like i find that that's people's biggest struggle like a lot of people when they're told that like they're spending like seven hours a day on their instagram they get really defensive when somebody says hey dial it back on the instagram because like they're just so used to looking at it or even just people with like like sometimes a person will spend three hours working out and they could spend one hour working out, like perhaps just uh, making things more efficient or um, not having your phone open for like social media during the workout. Cause sometimes like phone open for timing out a rest is fine, but phone open for just anything, not so fine. So I think it's important for people to address their, their teddy bear yeah, no, absolutely. That's 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 kind of what we're what we're looking at when we're looking at building out know, people's like strengths and strengths and weaknesses profiles in the first couple of weeks of the mentorship is like where do you feel like you have the most room for improvement, and like that's that's an area to be to be super honest and credit and, and open about yourself. And like that's the one that I find that most people are really really good at figuring out is they all like, people all know where their their weaknesses are, and they all know what they need to do and they all know how to do it, but like. The next step that we try to do is, okay, well, now build a step-by-step -step plan on how you are going to either eliminate that as a weakness or turn that weakness into a strength. And what can you do for it? And people are just like, uh, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I don't get it. And like, that's one of the biggest things that we try to do with this is like show people that, yeah, like there's like, you're going to suck at things. And like, I, there's a lot of things that I suck at and like, I'm trying, I'm still working on trying to figure out how I can turn those things that I suck at into things that I'm better at. Well, I think it's important that, uh, well, especially from like a mentor mentee standpoint, me as a mentee, I look for mentors that are also working on themselves, which I really value in like the whole team at compound performance. You guys are always working on improving yourself, even though you have like a wealth of experience that I can learn from you're still working on your skill set, which like it's kind of like the lead from the front or lead by example concept of like makes it so much easier to be under somebody's wing when that person is also working through their obstacles because then it's, it's kind of like encouraging. It's like, yeah, this is going to suck having to like strengthen our weaknesses, but we're not in this by ourselves. Like we're not alone, which I think is uh, important. Yeah, absolutely. It is. I mean, like that's that's that like, that is for sure something that's very important, and that's why 
we try to collect so much feedback from every single person who goes through the the mentorship. It's like we understand that our thing, that what we're doing is not perfect, and we're not getting, we're not going to nail everybody's expectations down. But what we want to do is we want to serve as many people as we can possibly serve and get as mu- as good of a product as we can possibly have done. So we always ask for a ton of different feedback. We try to be super objective and uh, critical with the feedback that we get, so that we can go, okay, well, this these twenty people hated this section. What can we do to fix this section to make it more useful and more t- and more like more util- uh, uh, usable for the people that we're talking to? And like that's that's what we kind of do is like we try to always be improving the stuff that we're doing, and we're trying to always take as much feedback as we can because we're only as good as our like I'm, like we're only as good as our last quarter. Right or like we're only as good as our last call, and if like each call is terrible or each quarter of the mentorship is terrible, then it just progressively gets worse and worse. And if we're not sitting there taking the feedback that we need to get better and to move forward, then we're never going to continue to 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 grow our business and grow what we're doing and get better at, our, at what we're doing for ourselves. It's so true. Um, something that I have my guests do near the end of every episode is they put out a challenge for the audience. So I want you to think of a challenge that you want my audience to do that uh, will make them better or put them outside of their comfort zone. And essentially what you're going to do is say your challenge for the day is and then just put it out there. My challenge for the day is to do something that has nothing to do with fitness. Yeah, no, that's good. Find something to do that has absolutely nothing to do with it. Read a book that has nothing to do with fitness. Like listen to a podcast that has nothing to do with fitness. Do something that has nothing to do with training and just see how you feel about it. Yeah, I love that. Um, If you're going to give one piece of advice to someone on how to live their life to the fullest, what would your piece of advice be? I'm terrible at that because I like I, I'm like I'm this kind of person that kind of compartmentalizes things and like I said like I will I'm I'm totally okay and this is it again comes from my martial arts background I am totally okay compartment uh, okay compartmentalizing my my own happiness and putting that into a small little bucket to achieve a certain task so like that's not something that I'm I'm really good at uh, at doing and like I I do that too I do that all the time where it's like well this is gonna suck for about eight months and then hopefully things will be better at the end of it but is going to be eight months of shittiness and like that's one of the things that i what i like that i i have as a strength of myself is like the ability to to dissociate and compartmentalize a little bit more but in terms of how to live people's life to the fullest like i'm not the person to talk about with that <laughs> one because of that and because i do that all the time very easily and it's probably a very unhealthy coping mechanism but you know what it's where we are it's all it's what we got so we're, we're all good well, yeah, and I can totally respect that because honestly, I think if people gave their honest answer, there's a lot of people that would be able to relate to that statement. And like, I'd rather hear how you actually are and meet you where you're at than like hear like the the fluffy cloud uh, smoke and mirrors version or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, that's one of the things is like, everybody knows that 2020 has been a rough year for everybody. And like, that's the thing is like, well, the groundwork that you're laying now is going to come to fruition later and it's done a really good job of showing people like who is actually going to be successful and who's actually going to make it or not like that's the thing that like I, I found with my ability to kind of dissociate and compartmentalize a little bit more is like I'm totally okay with being like well this is just how it's going to be for now and figuring out a way to adapt to that particular situation and then hopefully carrying those lessons on to the future so true So that basically wraps it up for us today. So I'd like to thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you having me on, man. Thanks for, uh, I'm glad that you had some patience to finally get this done.